this session is about forgetting about Agile, and hopefully you'll understand by the end of this session what I really mean about this, uh, with this. So I'm, as Jorge said, I'm the director of the Agile Competency Center globally for, uh, for EPEM. I started my career as a software engineer, and I really uh, fast I got into, uh, into Agile through working with those uh, individuals in, uh, in Belgium. And I moved to Canada uh, in 2008, where I started the Toronto Agile community. I co-founded this, um, and we are organizing conferences since then. So I need to give you a tiny bit of a background of what EPAM really is in order for you to understand the topic that I'm talking about, so in order for you to understand why it, it's so important to us. So what is EPAM Systems? EPAM Systems is uh, a software development organization focusing on product development. And we do product development in a variety of industries. But what is really important is what is underneath, what is our heritage, what is uh, our DNA, if you will. And really at heart, we are software engineers. We are core software engineers. We are people who um, to the code, who tackle um, really difficult uh, challenges and use that, those engineering skills to get to our customers and build solutions that work for them, that work for their users, and so forth. And over the years, obviously, uh, because we are a software development organization, we have expanded our knowledge, this core engineering knowledge, with an awful lot of um, tangential, if you will, um, disciplines that are extremely important and necessary as well to deliver high quality products. But we do have an engineering mindset. And if you, if you look at the, the number of people that we employ, and you might be a tiny bit uh, surprised when you see those numbers here, we are a fairly large organization. We have more than 12,600 uh, professional engineers, and more than 7,000 of those are actually trained in applying Agile principles. So why on earth, why on earth would I want to talk about forgetting about, about Agile? So hopefully that becomes more clear uh, as we go through the presentation. Also, there's more than 3,000 people uh, trained in applying DevOps practices, which I believe is extremely aligned with, uh, with Agile as well. And in, uh, in Mexico specifically, we have started an office uh, very recently, uh, right now in Guadalajara. So, um, so ETAM is active in Mexico as well since uh, this year. But I want to hear from you who you are. So I'm going to open a little poll and um, I'm actually hoping that you are able to see this right now and tell me a little bit about yourself. So if you could click, um, click which, which role you have, which role you usually uh, fulfill within the organization, then we have uh, a better understanding um, who we are talking, who we are talking to, and I can tailor the content of the webinar a little bit to you. Yeah, so the votes are coming in, which is great. I'm still waiting for a couple of extras. We have over 70 people, or we have about 70 people right now joining us, so hopefully you can all uh, tell me you are not going to wait too long. Great, so it looks like we have uh, an interesting mix, and I'll show you in a, in a second. It looks like we have an interesting mix between software engineers, project managers, and a couple of other roles as well. But most of you are software engineers, which is great, uh, which is also what I expected based on the content of the conference. So I'm going to close the poll right now, and that's all right. Um, we at least already have an, um, an interesting interview uh, to see who we're actually talking to. So why on earth do I want to talk about, forget about Agile? Why do I want to do that? Uh, especially given the fact that I lead the Agile Competency Center in EPEM and Agile is so important to us, otherwise we wouldn't train all these people. Well, I have to get back to the Agile Manifesto. For people who never have seen the Agile Manifesto, this is basically the manifesto upon which the Agile movement is built. And there are 17 people coming together in 2001, back then representatives of what was called lightweight methods. And they found their common ground and they basically said, um, if we work together, we all try to achieve the same things. We do it with different practices, but what is it that binds us together? What is it that we can go to the, to the customer with together? What is this, if you will, philosophy? 
And I'm going to cut out the things that most people don't read, which is the letters in the, in the beginning and the letters in the end, and I'm going to end with the four values. And, and when you look at those four values, the very first one, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, is not really talking about building software. It's not really talking about uh, what we care about as software engineers, which is um, delivering the right or delivering a product in the right way, being very proud of that product. What we're looking at here is um, a way to, to ensure that our processes and our tools are supporting our people for doing the work that they need to do, are supporting our people to interact and to communicate. This is really what this is all about. So if you look at this, this first value, it really is all about working as a team. And when you now look at the next set of values, the, first, the, the, the second, third, and fourth, Working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following the plan. This is all about building the right thing. Is working software is what we're really building. This is what our customer is waiting for, not necessarily for this documentation. So even though the documentation is important, you'll never hear me say that it's not. It's really the working software that we're trying to achieve. The same thing with customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Contracts are important, but if they prevent you from collaborating with your customer, if they prevent you from building the right thing, then there's something going wrong. And the same thing following up and responding to change. You might have heard this very famous quote. I believe it's attributed to Einstein, but I'm sure it's been attributed to many other people in the past as well. That is that planning is crucial, but the plan itself, the, the, the uh, deliverable, if you will, is not that useful at all because plans need to be able to change. So when you're following a plan, arriving at a product that your customer does not need, there is something wrong with that. So you need to be able to respond to change. But where in this Agile manifesto do we see anything that really appeals to software engineers, to people who are proud of the craft of software engineering? So there's nothing about building it right. Now, there was a gentleman who you might know, uh, Bob Martin, um, or Robert Martin, also called Uncle Bob, who um, tried to introduce a new value in the Agile Manifesto, and I believe it was in 2008 at the, um, the Agile Alliance conference. And he tried to introduce craftsmanship over crap. He said, um, well, we are, we were all craftsmen, the people who uh, originally wrote this manifesto, but apparently we have forgotten what it's really all about. And what we seem to be doing is we seem to be focusing more on process than on anything else. While individuals interaction open processes and tools is exactly the opposite. So what, what is it really that we do care about? And I want to hear from you as well. What is it that you care about? Uh, do you care most about working as a team? Do you care most about building the right thing? Or do you care most about building it right? I see some interesting movement here. Okay, so this is this is interesting. So it looks like there is, um, and I, as you're still voting, and I don't want to, I don't want to be quiet for the entire time because uh, you're you're listening on the other side. But as you're still voting, it looks like there is a very even mix between the three things. So I see, um, even though we. We kind of have half of the people who voted so far. We have a very even mix. So there is uh, about one third of working as a team, one third building it right thing, and about one third of building it right. So that's that's very interesting. Um, again, there's nobody voting anymore. I think that it stabilizes. All right, so I'm going to end the voting right now. Okay, so this is interesting, and you can you can see the results there as well. So literally, um, literally, there's an equal amount of all three, right? So it's everybody is, or um, as a group, as a team, you kind of, you kind of um, are interested in all three of them. So you care about all three of them. Well, we at EPAM, we care about all three of them as well. It, you can look at our values as well. Uh, building it right is a focus on the customer. Um, Working as a team is both in value the individual and uh, act as a team. Those are our five corporate values, by the way. But strive for excellence is the one I really want to point out. Strive for excellence is all about making sure that you build it right, making sure that you 
um, are proud of the, the piece of software that you have built, that you can go to your colleague and say, look, this is a piece of software that I have built right now. You can go and look in the code. I'm extremely proud of having done that. Um, it does what it needs to do, and it looks great. This is what we as engineers care about. Uh, instead of all the process work that oftentimes is associated with, with Agile. So let's build it right. Let's use that drive that we have internally as engineers. And instead of uh, using all those processes that, that Agile is, is prescribing, or at least some people consider that Agile is uh, prescribing, let's just look at uh, the engineering practices that we can introduce just to build it right and see where we end up. And when I look at building it right, there's actually two things that I have in mind. There's two things that are important to me. The first one is the, the obvious choice, I would say. Uh, the first one is delivering something with high quality. If I want to build something right, the right way, the first thing that it needs to have is high quality. It needs to work. It needs to not have any bugs, um, all of those things. But the second thing, and that's really important as well, if I consider something high quality, if I consider something being built right, then that means that it's extensible. That means my design allows for future uh, functionality to be included, for future functionality to be added to a uh, set of functionality that you already have. That means that it's maintainable. That means that it's, um, it's easy and, and, and cheap to maintain as well. So these are the two things that I am looking at when I want to build something right. And I'm going to use that going forward because we're going to apply those principles on a software delivery um, lifecycle. And I'm also going to use some of the knowledge of three um, great agile mindset people. And uh, you'll see in a bit who those are. Uh, those are quotes from three individuals. Uh, two of them have uh, co-written the Agile Manifesto. So let's start with the first one. It's a quote from Martin Fowler. Martin Fowler, um, in, in a series of blog posts that he wrote about uh, technical debt, uh, one of the things that he wrote at some point is that quality is not negotiable. And he explained this in a very good way. Um, this concept of quality is not negotiable, that the team needs to deliver with the highest possible quality. Let's try to use that and apply that in our software delivery um, system. So when you look at when you look at this, uh, this is software delivery lifecycle. You start with nothing and you end up with an enterprise application. When you think about quality is not negotiable, well, what is the first thing that you do? I'm assuming you're thinking about the same thing as I am. And the first thing that you do is you want to make sure that you rigorously test everything in your application. You want to make sure that before you actually go live with this application, that uh, everything is tested to ensure that it does not contain any bugs. That's the very first thing that we want to do. Now, OK, so this is great. And everybody understands that. There's no rocket science there. So when you look at, at the cost of fixing bugs, however, when you find a bug late in the process, when your software is almost entirely finished, it's going to be extremely expensive to fix that. It's going to take you longer to find a bug in the first place. And second, you have built an awful lot of other software on top of the bug that you introduced early on in the process. So the earlier you find the bug, or the closer to where it was introduced, the earlier you find the bug, the easier and cheaper it will be for you to fix it, which is, of course, important as well. So what can we do that? Well, very simple. We tested regular intervals throughout the application lifecycle. So instead of only testing at the end, let's do some component testing uh, early on as well when the component is ready. And when another component is ready or an extension to that component, component is finished, let's test that as well. And we continue testing uh, in small batches until the very end. So this is great, right? So what we already have is we used quality is not negotiable. We used our mindset of a software engineer and of building it right. And we got to a process where we regularly test before we put anything into production. Um, so it's great. It's really, really great. But there is a cost associated with that as well. Even though now we are cutting down on the cost of fixing bugs because we found the bugs earlier on in the process, every single time that we want to go through such a test phase or through such a test cycle, we need to build the application. We need to execute the tests. 
So that's going to be very expensive as well. So how do we find the balance between ensuring that we have enough tests and not spending too, money, too much money and too much time on doing all that testing and doing all that manual work? So obviously, and, and luckily, our engineering practices help us here as well. Uh, we can start including automated builds and automated test execution. So when we have an automated build, that basically says that we do not need to manually build everything. So we built this just uh, before we start the testing. We can even do automated deploy if we want to, uh, and we deploy it automatically on a test environment or on a UFG environment or whatever environments you test your, your uh, software on. And of course, the testing itself, the test execution itself can be automated as well. Uh, and especially at com on, on a component level, it's not going to be too expensive because you can do white box testing. It's not going to be too expensive to implement those tests and to uh, implement those, those automated tests. So we can, we can start automating an awful lot of things. If we look at the entire process, then we get to something which is already an awful lot better. Just using quality is not negotiable as a principle. And introducing the technical practices that help us to achieve um, our high quality, our built it right piece of software. Um, we just introduced a couple of test phases all the way with automated uh, deployment to reduce the cost, automated uh, build to reduce the cost of building it, and automated test execution to reduce the cost of making, of making sure that the application was built right. And we only did this based on this one principle. So the engineering practices that we introduced are rigorous testing, automated build, and automated test execution. And I kind of want to hear from you what you use in your projects right now. If you use any of those, um, those mechanics already, if you use automated build, if you use automated deploy, the difference between automated build, automated deploy, and continuous deploy, and here you can select multiple options, by the way. So the difference between automated build, automated deploy, and continuous deploy is that continuous deploy is triggered by a check-in to the uh, source code management system. So if you check in your code into Git or in Subversion or in whichever other system, Team City that you use, um, then uh, automatically the uh, continuous uh, integration server will pick up that build, will build it, and will automatically deploy it onto um, onto a, a, yeah, a test machine, if you will. OK, this is interesting. So most people seem to be using continuous build and continuous deploy, which includes, even though people have, don't seem to uh, be voting for automated build and automated deploy at the same time, which, so I'm assuming that includes it. Um, what I did not see, and this is not surprising, is that uh, automated tests on every build are not always included. So I see this oftentimes in, uh, in the industry that we do have automated build, we, ha we do have continuous integration, we do even have automation of some of our test scenarios, but what we do not have is that those test scenarios are automatically run on every single build. And oftentimes that is because they take too long to build, or oftentimes it also is because there is no standard way of setting up a test environment. So. I think uh, there's fewer people right now who are voting. So if you, um, okay, well that's that's right. So um, I see that that the automated build option looked like it was locked or disabled, which uh, was not the intention. So hopefully uh, other people are not experiencing that. Anyway, so there's a, a fewer people right now who are voting. So I'm not entirely sure if that means that uh, those people are not using any of those practices. Or if that means that, uh, and, and they just don't, don't click any of those things, or if that means that they do not have the information and they cannot um, confidently say um, what, what they are doing at this, this point. I'm going to wait until I have uh, half of the people uh, voted, which I believe is a good, um, a good sample size. OK, so I'll share the results with you guys. The vote is closed right now. Um, and you basically see that an awful lot of people are using continuous build and continuous deploy, but there's only 10% of the people who voted um, that actually, or the people who are on the call, that uh, use automated tests on every build. So you, as I already said, there's more people who have automated tests than people who use automated tests on every build. So that's interesting. Thanks, thanks for providing us with that information. 
Okay, so the first one that we looked at was quality is not negotiable. That's the first principle that we used. The second principle is a quote from Alistair Coburn. And Alistair Coburn was actually uh, the gentleman who invited uh, those 16 other people to Snowbird in Utah, to, um, which was the start of the meeting that led to the Agile Manifesto. And one of his quotes is, design is a series of unvalidated assumptions. And in fact, the way that Alistair Coburn it is that design is a series of unvalidated decisions. And he explains it on his blog posts uh, around uh, in, in this way. So every single time that we go from an idea to a working piece of software, what, uh, what we're doing is we're making decisions all the time. And we're making decisions about which functionality will solve the business need. Um, I'm seeing that I did not share the results. I hope I did. Yeah, I did share the results of the previous one. So hopefully, Beatrice, you have seen that in the meantime as well. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure that those results are, uh, of the service are still visible afterwards as well. So every single time that you, you take a step in that software delivery process, you do make decisions all the way. So you make decisions about which functionality will solve your customer need or your user need. You will make decisions about which architecture will support that solution uh, in its back end and, and integrate it with all of the other things that or systems that it needs to integrate with. Your design, and I mean your component, your, your software design um, is, is a decision that is based on the assumption that the software design will make it easy for you to build the software that you need to build will make it easy for you to deal with future requirements, future requests. The UX design is based on the assumption that, uh, or the decision that we have made around the UX design is based on the assumption that this particular UX widget will make it easier for our users to work with the software and so forth. So there's an awful lot of decisions along the way. But the interesting thing is that those decisions are unvalidated until they are actually used. So in terms of, for instance, the design, the design is only validated when programmers start programming in that design. And when they hit a problem that the design does not allow them to easily fix. Or the functionality, the fact that we build a certain type of functionality uh, or include a certain type of feature in, into our software is only validated at the end whether or not this feature is valuable and is helping our customers to move forward. So only when the users are starting to use it, and I think it's a, an amazing feature, only then do we know that we made the right decision in the beginning, in the very beginning of the software delivery lifecycle. So when you make those decisions, and those decisions turn out to be wrong, they turn out to be based on false assumptions, on an assumption that is absolutely not true, the longer you wait for those decisions, um, to be validated, the more uh, expensive it will be to change a wrong decision. So it's pretty much the same thing as finding a bug late in the process. This is finding a, a decision, a wrong decision late in the process is also more expensive than finding a wrong decision early in the process because you haven't based too much work on top of that wrong decision yet. So what can we do? What can we do to ensure that the cost of wrong decisions is less than if we don't uh, validate them at all. So we have actually two uh, technical practices that we use for that. So the first one is using spikes. And those are primarily about um, technical decisions. So technical decisions that we make around um, which database schema are we going to use, um, what is what is uh, going what is the design going to be, what is the architecture going to be, uh, maybe which uh, cloud solution are we going to use. Those are all kinds of technical decisions that we are making that we can use spikes for. So what is a spike? A spike is, um, is kind of a, a time boxed uh, period of time that you, um, you use to get more information about a certain decision that you need to make. This might be an estimate. You might say, you know what, I cannot estimate this piece of functionality right now with the information that I have. I need to do some more research. So you set a little bit of time aside to find enough information, not to fix the whole thing, but to find enough information so you can confidently estimate 
the work that is required. Maybe you have two alternatives. Maybe you want to solve a certain problem in one way and you have an alternative way as well. And you really honestly do not know which one is going to be the best one, which one is going to be the easiest to build, which one is going to give you the best results. So what you can do in a spike, you can say, okay, so let's set four hours aside. We work two hours on implementing one idea. You work two hours on implementing the other idea. And then we validate, we do a retrospective and we validate which one was the most, uh, the easiest one to do, which one is most promising. And then we choose based on a little bit more information. So what we're doing is we're validating technical assumptions earlier on in the process just by including a couple of spikes. Instead of making a decision based on a huge assumption, we are validating our assumption before we make the decision. Now we also, because the biggest assumption that we have in software engineering, of course, is the fact that the functionality that we're building is actually solving our user's need, is solving our user's problem. So what we can do to validate those assumptions is to uh, pretty much actually add customer feedback earlier on in the process. So um, when we, instead of building the components that we talked about earlier on, where we included um, tests uh, along the way during the software delivery lifecycle, instead of only doing that, we can actually ask the customer to provide some feedback. If we structure our delivery, if we structure our application, the building of our application in such a way that we build a small piece that we can give to the customer and the customer can get feedback, we are validating an assumption an awful lot earlier. We are validating that decision an awful lot earlier. And if we find out after, let's say, one month of work, that the direction that we're going in, that the, the functionality or how we build this functionality is not useful for our end user, or they, uh, they say like, well, this is okay, but actually this other piece of functionality would be more important, that is already helping us to make better decisions going forward. So pretty much based on the understanding that design is a series of invalidated assumptions until you actually put your software in the hands of the end user. Just by using that, we introduced two technical practices using spikes and using incremental delivery that help us with building it right. It's still, don't forget this, we were still working from a mindset of, we are software engineers, we don't care about all those processes, what we really care about is building it right. But we also, of course, want to make sure that we validate our assumptions and that we um, make the right decisions. And in order to do that, we, uh, we use those practices. So I kind of want to hear from you which kind of technical practices that you use. Do you use architectural spikes? Do you uh, use any spikes specifically to increase your confidence in, uh, in your estimates? Do you use uh, incremental delivery? Um, so incremental delivery basically means that every single time that you, um, you build something, you actually have something valuable to show to your end user and you're able to get feedback. You do product demonstrations to get feedback from your end users or maybe A-B testing or, or multivariate testing or variation of any of those. Um, so what is that A-B testing? A-B testing is basically putting a functionality uh, in front of your end user uh, without them knowing which version you have an A uh, solution and a B solution and you basically add statistics to it and you try to measure what the um, what the benefit is of uh, either solution. So let's say you do a, you have an e-com solution and you're uh, testing the look and feel of how you present your uh, products to your end users. Um, you will have a, a set of people who will see the A design and a set of people who will see the B design. And then you have the statistics and see how, how many products are sold with A and how many products are sold with B. Right? So this is kind of how I beat A-B testing is, is working. This is interesting. So the, again, int very interesting results. And I'm very, uh, very glad that I was able to, to add those polls. Going to, to give you another 30 seconds to, uh, to see if there's other people who still want to vote and who still want to see uh, or share with us what, um, what they are doing. So I see that there's not too many people using architectural spikes. There's not too many people also using spikes to increase the confidence in an estimate. Uh, an awful lot of people uh, talk, are talking about uh, incremental delivery. So it's about 35% of, of all the people 
uh, who are participating that claim right now that uh, there is something valuable being delivered at the end of, uh, of a, every increment or at the end of every iteration or something like that. And uh, we have product demonstrations as well to get feedback from the end user and I'll share, I'll end the voting right here and I'll share the results with you so that you can see them yourself as well. And there is not an awful lot of AB or multivariate testing going on uh, with most uh, what with most teams. So it looks like we do incremental delivery. We do try to build a valuable product uh, regularly so we can get feedback from our end user. We do product demonstrations so we can get feedback from those customers as well. But there is no real uh, A-B testing going on in production. That's interesting. Thank you so much for, your, uh, for sharing that information. OK, so let's get to the third one. Let's get to the third uh, principle or the third quote, which comes from Mary Poppendieck. And if you don't know who Mary Poppendieck is, uh, Mary and Tom Poppendieck wrote the, uh, the book um, Lean Software Development and brought Lean actually from, um, to the software development industry, if you want to put it that way. They had worked for Toyota, they had worked for 3M, worked for a couple of other organizations as well, and, um, and they learned an awful lot from them. And what this actually really is, and the quote, and I heard this the first time at a conference in Montreal a couple of years ago, uh, the biggest defect is to tolerate defects. And if you do not understand Japanese, uh, don't worry, I don't either. But this this is is uh, is pronounced as pokayoke. And what pokayoke really means is it, it means uh, mistake proof. So it means that you build basically um, into the process, you, you remove the mistakes from the process. So you do not allow the process to create any mistakes. And this is a, a principle that Toyota uses, um, also based on the idea that it never is a people problem, it always is a process problem. So if the process allows you to make a mistake, there is something wrong about the process. You need to fix the process. So um, a great example of that, for instance, is a, a, U, um, a USB uh, connection. A USB connection can only be plugged into a laptop in one way. You can't plug it in in two different ways. So you can't plug it in wrong. The same thing with an Ethernet connection. Um, and especially with the newer USBs where you, you can actually reverse the, uh, uh, the connector, it's even easier to do. So there's no wrong way to add a USB connector into uh, or plug it into a, to a laptop. So when we look at the, our process that we, what we have so far and our entire software delivery process. Now we included some spikes, we got some tests um, along the way, we got customer feedback. So the test is to make sure that we uh, reduce the cost of uh, bugs that we introduce. The customer feedback is to make sure that we reduce the cost of the wrong assumptions we make about the, the, the functionality that we're building and so forth. Using our software delivery process, we have already included those things, but it does not prevent us yet from introducing bugs. It does not prevent us yet from starting an iteration built or building the wrong functionality or based on the wrong assumptions of what the customer needs. So when we look a little bit um, into, let's say, one iteration, so we, we're working our way through words one iteration. This is no longer the full software delivery lifecycle, but we have an iteration and at the end of this iteration, we build a small piece of software. It's an incremental piece. We have some spike in the middle. But what can we do to ensure that we are not introducing any bugs? Well, luckily, there is actually a uh, technical process that helps us to, uh, to implement this. And it's test-driven development or test-first development. So test first development goes like this. Um, when you write an automated test, basically, and you write the test before you even write the code that's supposed to make this test pass. So the first thing that you do is you write a failing test. And so you're basically proving that this piece of functionality does not work. And then you make the test pass. So you uh, get a piece of functionality that makes the test work. And then the next step that you do is, because you want to get back to your good design, is you refactor your original code, so your production code. And you can, refactoring basically means changing the design and the layout and all of those things of the code without changing the functionality. And you can confidently do this because you have 
an automated test harness, you have a set of automated tests that you run on a regular basis. So you change that, you refactor that, and then you refactor your tests as well without changing, um, and restructuring the tests without uh, changing the functionality of the tests. And what you're actually doing is you're introducing Pokayoke into your software delivery lifecycle. You're explicitly saying, I will not allow my process to introduce any bugs by testing first and proving that the bug is there and then fixing it right away. So even before we write the production code, we already have the test to ensure that this, uh, that a bug is not allowed in that code. So this is a, quite of an interesting way, quite an interesting way to do it. But this is only talking about technical issues. This is only talking about technical bugs. We're not talking about any customer issues yet, any misunderstanding of what the customer needs in terms of functionality. So the next thing that we can do is, at the beginning of an iteration, we can validate the understanding with, for instance, a product owner, which is what we do in a typical Scrum environment, for instance. We, in the beginning of a sprint, we, um, for people who do not know what Scrum is, Scrum is one of those lightweight methods that works in sprints, those are iterations of typically one to four weeks. The most common one is two weeks. And um, there's a few, a few meetings actually that are happening, work meetings, and the first one is the planning at the beginning of that sprint. And you plan for just enough work that you can do and that, uh, that you can release in that sprint. And at the end, you have a new product increment or a potentially shippable product increment. So at the beginning, what we're doing is we're validating our understanding in a planning meeting, validating our understanding with the customer, validating our understanding with maybe potential business analysts or maybe even users if we can, even before we start coding even before we start building all of that stuff. And then at the end, we can, of course, test and get feedback on uh, not only our understanding, but also uh, about what we have delivered. Now, the interesting thing is we can drive this even further. And some people might have heard of, for instance, uh, behavior-driven development or acceptance test-driven development um, or specification by example, which is a book written by Goko Edgich that gives you a really good indication of how all these things are supposed to work. So what is this? What you're doing is you're writing your, or you're defining your business requirements, your product requirements as a set of examples. And examples are very concrete pieces of information that actually indicate how a piece of functionality is supposed to work. So let's say that you're calculating taxes. You're building an application that calculates taxes. Then you can say, well, given a certain profile, when I um, calculate my taxes, my result is exactly this. So given a certain profile of being, um, I'm living alone, I do not own a house, I have a job, uh, my income is X dollars, uh, what is the tax, uh, what is my calculation of my taxes that I need to pay? So that's a specific example, a specific example that actually allows you to automatically take that example, turn it into a test, and run those tests automatically at the end when this software is delivered. And they call this specification by example. So what you're actually doing is you're specifying your requirements based on examples and concrete test cases even before you started implementing your functionality. You build those test cases before you start building your functionality. And at the end, you because they're written in such a way that they are parsable and they can automatically be run, in the end, uh, you have an automated test suite testing the behavior of your system. So what we've done right now is we look at the third one, which is the biggest defect is tolerant defect, which is a, a quote from Mary Poppendick. And we introduced two new technical practices. The first one was test first development to prevent technical defects from being introduced. And the second one was to use examples to prevent functional defects from being introduced, to ensure that we really understand what we're trying to build and that we even have a, an automated framework to validate that understanding and to validate our implementation against that understanding. Right? So let me hear from you. Um, this is the last poll, by the way. Uh, what kind of practices you use in your teams? 
Do you use test-driven development? Do you use test-first development? Do you do your regular planning sessions to align the understanding of functionality with your uh, product owner? Do you uh, use examples to clarify the requirements? Uh, and do you actually do behavior-driven development? I'm very interested to see what the results of this this one is because BDD is, is not necessarily a very uh, popular or commonly used approach, uh, even though it's so powerful. It's very, very, very powerful. Okay, this is very interesting. Still looking for some more results. We got 30 out of uh, almost 90 people right now who voted. I'm going to try to uh, go up to at least 45 so that we have uh, a very decent sample size. It's interesting, we're almost there. So I see based on, on 40 votes right now, well, I can't end the voting and show it to you yet, so I have to wait until uh, I have my 45 in. But I see based on, on 40 votes, and you still have a few seconds to vote, that um, most people do indeed regular planning sessions to align the understanding of the functionality and to, um, I'm going to end the voting right now, and to basically speak with, for instance, a product owner, sharing results, there you go, speak with, for instance, a product owner uh, to um, ensure that we're building the right thing, that we're we know why the functionality is there. We know what the benefit of that functionality is for your uh, end user and so forth. Uh, most people do that. There's an awful, an awful lot um, of test-driven development as well, I would say. 21% is actually more than I expected because it is a, a, an advanced practice and it's not an easy practice to, to do. And behavior-driven development, uh, I'm not surprised, is uh, even less than that. Um, so examples to clarify requirements, I'm actually quite surprised that uh, almost 30% of the people who voted, uh, or not 30% of the people who voted, but I think it's 30% of the 88 people who right now are signed up, that almost 30% of those use examples to clarify the requirements. That's, that's a very good uh, metric. I'm very happy about that. Okay, that's great. So, so what, ha what have we done so far? So the only thing that we've done is we said, forget about Agile, forget about all that process. I, I, don't, I don't care about that process. I care about building it right. I care about being proud of my code, to go to my colleague, to show off my code and say, look, this is what I've built. You can you look into that. I'm really, really proud of it. So we use technical practices and engineering practices based on three quotes and three principles from, um, from Martin Fowler. Um, Alistair, Alistair Coburn and uh, Mary Poppin did. We used those quotes to get to an application of a couple of technical practices, rigorous testing, automated build, automated test execution, spikes, incremental delivery, test-driven development, and behavior-driven development. And I think like, whoa, wait a second. And you look at all those engineering practices and the way that we apply them, this looks, this looks fairly familiar. So by building it right, by being based on high quality and making sure that our software stays maintainable using those quotes we end up with a process that looks very much like this we end up with a process that inside an iteration we have or inside a product increment we validate our understanding early on even using bdd if we're advanced we use test driven development along the way we use spikes in case we need to validate some assumptions before we make a decision to make sure basically that we don't make the wrong decision and we do rigorous testing in the end through automation as well, of course, otherwise it would uh, cost too much time and uh, it would cost too much money as well. And we also get customer feedback through demos and, um, and other ways through A-B testing and so forth. So when we do this and we expand into a full process, we get something that looks, I don't know if you know this image, but it looks very similar to Scrum for me. So every single time that we uh, move and that we basically go from one place to another, we basically build another product increment. And we have a full life cycle um, with all the things that we talked about. We talked about testing, we talked about spikes, we talked about all these things. And whatever is here in the beginning, that's your product backlog. So all of the work that is split up in such a way that you can get customer feedback. So it's kind of funny actually that by using 
our software delivery mindset by using our engineering mindset that we end up with the same processes that Agile is trying to teach us. So if you go back to the Agile manifesto and still think like, oh, wait a second, there was a piece that we kind of skipped over because most people don't read it. And the piece is, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Better ways of developing software. It already and always was about building it right. This was a premise that each and every one of those 17 people, part of writing the Agile Manifesto, had before they even started thinking about writing it down. So everybody was a craftsman, hands down. No discussion there. Well, crap does not even need to be part of the value because it is uh, the basis of everything else. So what I'm really trying to say is that forget about all these processes. Forget about, forget about what, what uh, some people say about, about Agile. If you're really serious about software engineering and you really want to build the right products, you really want to be proud of what you do, you have to be serious about software craftsmanship. There's absolutely no other way to do it. So forget about Agile and excel at software engineering. And please use Agile practices in order to get there. Those practices are valuable. You can use them. So this was my message. Um, I hope this was valuable. And I'm, I, th I think we still have some time for a couple of questions if you, if you have some. This session was recorded as well. You can still see the recording uh, afterwards, I'm sure. OK, so how about other methods to ensure quality like code reviews? Do you use them? Yeah, this is, uh, this is actually a great, a great question. So code reviews are very valuable. Um, the code re reviews also come after the fact. So what you often see with code reviews is um, that you create a bottleneck. So whenever somebody, let's say a junior for, for argument's sake, um, a junior is writing a certain piece of code, it's submitted for code review, and a senior developer or architect or whatever, will, however the roles are within your organization, uh, will review that code before it actually goes live. There's a few things that are happening there. The review is, is oftentimes done in isolation, and uh, people need to write all of that stuff down. They need to write the feedback down about the code review and then send it back to the person who originally wrote the code. And this person needs to update the code as a new review. And it takes an awful lot of time. Uh, well, there's actually multiple ways. And so it kind of depends also uh, about the culture in your organization. Another way of doing this is actually do pair programming. Um, so when you do pair programming uh, together with a junior and a senior, for instance, you will do review as you go forward. Now, on top of that, the, uh, the junior will also um, be engaged in the conversation and understand an awful lot better where those recommendations come from. Now, if that goes too far for you, what you can do instead as well is you can do, but do the review with the person who actually wrote the original code right next to you. So you can uh, explain why the feedback is what it is, and you can together change the original code. So that, that would be, in my opinion, a first step towards a better piece of code review. But code review is important. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. So where do we start? Where do we start? What if our customer doesn't know at all about Agile? Well, you start with, um, with practicing the things that you care about. And basically, is what we are doing as well. You start with practicing um, software craftsmanship. You start with uh, trying to see what you can do without your customer involved. You can validate your customer understanding by once in a while um, delivering something and basically uh, asking them how it went. Uh, you can start automating uh, tests for yourself. You can start thinking with them in, um, in examples and actually writing those examples down and using those examples as automated tests. All of those things are things that you can do that you don't necessarily need the customer for. And uh, when the customer starts seeing those benefits, they will ask you. Uh, they will ask you as well on how they can help even more. I, I have a couple of examples from there, but unfortunately, I can I don't think I can go too deep 
uh, into it. But let me let me give you one quick one though. So for a customer of ours also uh, was working a very waterfall approach. Uh, we wanted to start implementing Agile, um, but we needed to comply as well with all of the um, the waterfall affected. So we had to have a detailed design of front and so on. And so we did all. But within our delivery uh, piece, what we basically said is okay. We will just split up the functionality into pieces that we can deliver in two weeks, and then once in a while go to our customer and ask, hey, is, did we understand this correctly? So the first time we went to our customer, the customer got the, uh, the feedback and was able to, to see it and said like, oh, this is great, so by when am I going to have this? I said, well, it's actually ready. Oh, he said, this is, this is not a PowerPoint, this is not like a demo. No, 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 this is, this is ready. We're actually asking you feedback about something that you can already use, about something that already integrates with your backend systems that is tested, that is documented. And then the customer came back and it's great, so why would we not release that already in, in, into production? And this way, actually, we got uh, more impact uh, on, on how the software was delivered uh, at that particular customer, just by showing the results and by doing what we could do without their um, well, without necessarily them understanding what Agile is, basically just show the results. See a couple of other questions. Um, okay. What would be a good approach? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I basically just gave that. So Christian, hopefully I uh, answered your question there as well. What can you say about when an engineer uh, can have a better direction that can shift the product functionally in a better way uh, than the desired at the beginning? Well, the suggestion that I have is do a spike. Uh, spend a very small uh, amount of time, uh, something that is that is defendable, um, and build build out a demo demo of the the other direction of that functionality, and just propose it to your customer. In the end, the customer still makes the choices. I usually appreciate that you are a that you are um, taking ownership of the direction of the product as well. So I would uh, I would do that. Yeah. So the uh, it seems that the total quality Japanese approach is still alive. Uh, luckily, it is. Yes, absolutely. In 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 various forms. Um, yeah, and Lean can absolutely be uh, applied. To, and um, so there is an awful lot of Agile and Lean conferences these days. The reason why Agile and Lean uh, is not really always called. Uh, in the same sentence is because the book um, Lean Software Delivery or Lean Software Development only got after the Agile Manifesto was published. So I would, um, I think, to be very honest, if, if that book was published before 2001, it would have been automatically part of the Agile Manifesto. Okay, so I think that this uh, concludes the time that I have and I need to give you a little bit of time to go to your next session. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for being here and uh, for participating in the polls. And hopefully uh, this was valuable for all of you.